Welcome, and thank you for joining today's teleconference, Aquaculture National Plan and VS Five-Year Business Plan. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send the chat to the event producer. Throughout the presentation, you can submit questions through the chat, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, and enter your questions in the message box provided. All audio lines will be muted for the duration of the call. With that, I will turn the call over to Liz Fernandez. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with the Professional Development Services Branch, and I'd also like to welcome you to today's webinar. Our speaker today is Dr. Kathleen Hartman. Dr. Hartman is the Aquaculture Program Leader for USDA APHIS Veterinary Services. She's been with USDA APHIS VF for over 15 years, first as an aquaculture epidemiologist and then as the Aquaculture Coordinator in Import-Export Services. Dr. Hartman is stationed in Ruskin, Florida at the University of Florida Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. She received a master's from the University of Maryland and both a DVM and PhD from Virginia Tech. She has a courtesy assistant professor appointment at the University of Florida in the program of fisheries and aquatic sciences. Dr. Hartman has served on the professional standards committee of the American Fisheries Society Fish Health Section and has been a certified aquatic animal health inspector since 2008. She is a current member and director on the board of the World Aquatic Society and is the immediate past president of the U.S. Aquaculture Society. Dr. Hartman also writes a column for Aquaculture Magazine called Health Highlights. And with that, I'll turn the webinar over to Dr. Hartman. Thank you so much, Liz, and thank you everybody out there for joining us this morning. Um, I always appreciate your time and attention to the wonderful and exciting and ever-expanding world of aquaculture. Today, we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about what aquaculture is in case there are still folks out there that might not be quite sure what we mean when we talk about aquaculture. And if you're not sure yet that the A's in APHIS um, include aquaculture in our aquatic animals uh, around the world. I'll then share a little bit with you about the five-year business plan, which the VS units have been working on really hard these past, now almost a year, it's hard to believe. Also, uh, share some exciting and progressive movement with the CAPS program. And then finally, uh, we have been working with our industry partners on updating the formerly National Aquatic Animal Health Plan which is now being updated into a National Aquaculture Health Protection and Inspection Plan. So again, thank you for joining us today, and uh, I hope you all enjoy the next hour. I just want to um, set the stage a little bit about the birth of aquaculture in this country. Aquaculture has been a form of agriculture for centuries. In fact, we have evidence of tilapia being cultured back in the early Egyptian times um, where those were a substance uh, farming for communities that uh, had that capability uh, of the natural resources around them. In this country, aquaculture started as a natural resource stock enhancement venture. You can see from the photos I'm projecting here, uh, the picture on the right with the building of the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. The picture is probably circa mid to late 1800s, uh, and in the foreground there is the classic fish wagon. And these fish wagons would be loaded up with water and typically trout or salmonid species and be taken around to the local communities. Um, either for human consumption purposes or for stocking out into the water bodies around the nation's capital at that time, which is really exciting. And here you can see now where uh, towards me out of the picture would be where Arlington National Cemetery is. Uh, and you can see there in the, the foreground of the picture those water bodies that were being stocked with these animals that were being cultured in our federal system 
to protect our native aquatic animal species in this country. Uh, and so from that culturing, we have now moved into what we really refer to as aquaculture. Aquaculture, from the definition in the, from the 1980 National Aquaculture Act, means the propagation and rearing of aquatic species in controlled or in selected environments. Now, it has been a real revelation about how well worded uh, this definition is from the 1980s. Uh, it does not reflect back on where those animals were sourced from, whether the, the, they were wild caught or farm raised in uh, their origin. Simply, it is the practice of controlling and protecting the health and uh, care of those animals uh, during this life stage grow out uh, that we as humans are participating in. Aquaculture also includes on the animal side of things, the fish, mollusks, crustaceans, invertebrates like sea cucumbers and sea stars and that kind of thing, amphibians, reptiles, but also aquatic plants. Uh, and we are seeing an explosion of micro and macro algae culture, particularly in our coastal areas. Um, and we see that side of aquaculture really becoming a burgeoning industry in this country as well, which is super exciting. In fact, it used to be down in the Tampa area at the National Airport, International Airport, uh, that the number of fish boxes leaving was only outdone by the number of snowbirds that had passed away down here in Florida and were being sent home. Now, it's actually the aquatic plants that make up the majority of our aquatic animal boxes leaving the state of Florida. Um, and again, we're seeing that also with the uh, rapidly growing aquaponics um, practice uh, as well. So just very quickly, in case you're wondering, well, what does aquaculture need to exist? When I was first getting into aquaculture, one of the most valuable and key rule of thumbs to remember about aquaculture is that you need a constant supply of suitable quality water for the species that you're culturing. I'll talk a little bit later about the number of species that are in culture around the world, and not all of them are obviously created equal. Some are live in freshwater, brackish water, which can range anywhere between uh, 3 to 5 percent salt water all the way up to uh, seawater. Some of our species can move and exist at many levels of salinity, um, but also the hardness of the water, how um, the buffering capacity of the water and the water chemistry differ between uh, the species that we're culturing there as well. But again, we need that constant supply to ensure that aquaculture will be successful. Particularly when we're talking about our domestic industry and looking at the challenges, um, where we are bottlenecked right now here in this country is the existence of a reliable year-round egg supply of the species that we do have in culture. For example, our Atlantic salmon uh, industry is really restricted domestically by um, a limited supply of uh, Atlantic salmon eggs, such that our industry guys that are growing out Atlantic salmon uh, in the new land-based systems that are coming online, those types of things, are having to still import uh, those eggs into this country. Uh, same with a lot of our other species that are out there. Uh, so that's something we do need to overcome, and our colleagues on the ARS side are certainly spending a lot of time and energy looking into how we can improve the genetics of the animals that we have in production here. And of course, like any other commodity, there needs to be a reliable and consistent market so that our producers have those markets readily and constantly available to them to make this a prof profitable entity around uh, the United States and the world. So why is aquaculture important? And I know many of you on the line today must, you know, um, 
get frustrated with me, and but I just know, and when anybody cuts me, I must bleed out little fish cells. But um, aquaculture has always been important and always part of our country's um, picture with catfish um, as part of our culture in the South here. But as we look at the global uh, populations, and if we look at the trend of where our seafood comes from in this country, we begin to see really how important aquaculture is globally and also how incredibly important it is domestically that we continue to grow and foster its development. In the United States right now, we are the seafood that we eat 90 to 92 percent of that is imported from a foreign country. Most of our imports come from Asia and South America. Now, if we look at population growth around the world, we see that Asia, South America, and certain parts of Africa are the burgeoning areas. As these populations themselves become more dense, they are going to have less exports as they have to feed their own populations within their borders, meaning that there will be less seafood available to export to the United States and other countries that rely on that. So really supporting aquaculture and understanding aquaculture is about food security. Uh, if we don't support aquaculture growth in this country, we will see a seafood deficit. Um, the other really exciting thing about aquaculture and its potential in the United States is that the United States has one of the world's largest footprint of the exclusive economic zone, which is the area offshore outside state waters but before international waters. And that is an area that we call our federal uh, water zone, I guess. Uh, and recently, we are just now beginning to see the potential of aquaculture development in those areas. Right now, we have no aquaculture existing in those areas, with the exception of a couple of now uh, pilot projects that are out there. Many coastal states also have a heavy regulatory environment in the state waters that have really limited aquaculture's potential in those uh, areas as well. Also, we're going to talk about the sustainability of aquaculture. And of course, sustainability can mean a lot of different things to a couple of people, but uh, one of the important concepts of sustainability, not only from the business side of things, but it's also the environmental impact. And how can we mitigate uh, the impact of this agricultural commodity on our environment? So within the last decade, aquaculture has seen some really exciting um, potential and also support by previous, uh, perhaps, competitors from the commercial fishing side. Commercial fishing side, if you think about it, are, are hunter and gatherers of natural resources that bring wild caught stocks into the ports, into the seafood markets, and then disperse apart across our country as uh, seafood uh, for human consumption. Prior to perhaps the last decade, there has been great animosity between commercial fishing and aquaculture where it was really difficult to see them both existing um, with a common goal uh, to feed people. And also, we can use aquaculture to protect our wild stocks and allow some of the numbers that have been depleted to regain that population vigor again, and yet not sacrifice the availability of a wholesome protein uh, product that's available worldwide. By 2030, 62% of our food will come from aquaculture. We can see that 33% of our wild populations of aquatic animals in our marine environments are already overfished. Many of them, too, are already at the maximal sustainability level. And unfortunately, 10% have already been overfished, and some of those to the, to the edge of complete extinction. 
We also see from the map below that 12% of the world's population depends on fisheries and aquaculture to support their livelihood. And when we think about that in the global picture, that is a very significant chunk of the impact and uh, role of aquaculture in sustaining us as a, as a planet. Also, if we think about the impact of aquaculture on the environment, we can see, and I don't want to, you know, I love a good steak and chicken, and believe me when I say I love bacon as good as anybody else. But when we look at the numbers on the animal production side, the sustainability and impact of aquaculture is very different from the pictures from our traditional livestock animals. We can see there one of the numbers that blew me away early on in my graduate program in aquaculture is the feed conversion ratio of fish. One to one, um, a pound of feed equals a pound of meat on that animal, which is really impressive. Uh, and you can see the numbers represented those for the other uh, animals there. And for some of our aquatic species, that FCR ratio actually drops down below one, which is even really uh, impressive there as well. Also, if we look at the carbon footprint in the image on the bottom there, uh, fish and aquaculture uh, are well below the traditional livestock. And of course, then when we look over here at the consumption of fresh water or the use of fresh water in the production of these animals, fish, again, come down to the very, very low end of that, making it a very um, sustainable animal agricultural entity uh, around the world. Yesterday, I had an opportunity to have a breakfast with uh, one of our net pin culture company uh, representatives, and he was explaining to me uh, what was going on in their net pins, and I was stunned to learn that, you know, when we see uh, some of these um, documentaries on aquaculture, we can see, and even in Finding Nemo, you know, at the, the sea nets, the fish's faces are pushed through and they look like they're packed so dense. And this gentleman yesterday was telling me that really those net pens are stocked at less than 2% of capacity or, or potential biomass. Um, and I'll show you pictures of what these big sea cages look like. So the image of what aquaculture is is very different than what we might see in the media as well. So I encourage you uh, to remember that as we um, talk about what aquaculture is. Globally, uh, aquaculture, again, we can see that uh, by a top 20 country ranking, uh, Asia certainly has most of the world uh, beat. We see North Africa there uh, lock in at number eight um, with Egypt. And then, of course, down out of the top ten are countries uh, in South America. And at number 17 is the United States, which is fantastic uh, that we're in the top 25 there. But, again, I want everybody hopefully to appreciate that we haven't even begun to tap into our potential of how aquaculture can grow and expand in this country. Again, aquaculture in 2015 passed a really exciting mark for the first time in our history uh, where aquaculture, um, seafood production was provided majority by aquaculture or farm raised of these animals around the world which again was really exciting um, for an industry. The 2016 data you can see there, I do want you to look down at the bottom with the um, agriculture commodity index uh, projecting there, and you can see for aquaculture, that projection is growing at a rate of 7%. And a couple of weeks ago when I was preparing for this talk, I did benchmark that 7% against some of our traditional livestock species, and we are about double of the project, projected growth on a commodity global scale that way. Um, so again, we clearly see that uh, aquaculture globally is expanding. Um, even in the last 50 years, 
we have seen a 245% increase of the amount of fish that are being moved around the, the, the world um, for seafood consumption. We have globally about 608 aquaculture species in production. Uh, 424 of those were reported in 217. And if anybody's scratching their head to see how that might compare to say poultry or um, uh, cattle for milk and uh, beef, those numbers are typically down around the 20s. Um, 20 species globally that might be in production for milk, beef, uh, and then I think it's a little bit lower for our poultry species. So again, you can see aquaculture is incredibly diverse. Again, we have uh, fish, crustaceans, mollusks, invertebrates, reptiles. Um, it's really incredible. You can see here um, from the top 10 species uh, by quantity that are from 2017, certainly the cyprinids, which would be our carp species. Uh, you can see the seaweeds there are very competitive with our live animals. Uh, and then the tilapias, oysters, clam, and salmonids um, are there. So basically when you think about global aquaculture, cyprinids, the carp species, the salmonid species, uh, salmon and trout, catfish species, and then our aquatic plants, and then the crustaceans and mollusks should really begin to form your picture of what that looks like. Here in the United States, we have more fish in culture in aquaculture settings than we do of mollusks and crustaceans, but that margin uh, is becoming closer and closer and closer. Um, we, catfish is still the number one species that is cultured in the United States, particularly in the southern southeast delta area with salmonids, tilapia, and uh, bass, mostly our hybrid striped bass, uh, rounding out that quartet there. We also have a number of species that are um, part of the bait and ornamental industry. Uh, um, that are in popular culture as well. Then, of course, we've got the oysters, clams, and mussels that represent the majority of our molluscan species, and shrimp and crayfish um, for the crustaceans that way. End uses, again, are incredibly diverse in this country. Human consumption, um, certainly we'd like to turn that corner where we are consuming more of what we raise here in this country rather than importing it. Um, but we'd also, aquaculture uh, plays a really significant role, and I think a lot of people forget about this, that conservation and restoration would be much more difficult if we didn't have the practice and enterprise of commercial aquaculture to subsist, subsist uh, those activities that way. A couple of years ago, I was on an airplane and was sharing with my seat partner in the next seat uh, what I did and, you know, why USDA was involved in aquaculture and how important that was. And the gentleman in the row in front of me turned around and he was like, you're part of the problem. You're, you know, the environmental impact. And um, I said, well, you know, where are you from? And he said, I'm from Washington. Oh, I'm from Alaska and I'm a salmon fisher, uh, commercial fisheries and aquaculture is killing my business. And you know, I said, you do realize, of course, that the fish that you are collecting in large part had their life beginning um, from aquaculture and many of the hatcheries in our federal and state systems uh, participate in making sure that those populations remain uh, healthy and strong. Research in biomedical, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about the zebrafish or the zebra danio, which is oftentimes used as um, sentinel animals for effluent water testing. Uh, but we also have the puffer fish, the green spotted puffer fish has now been determined to have the smallest genome of any living species. And so it's a very popular model to use in genetics research. Uh, also biomedical, the Paku species has a 
um, enzyme in their uh, mucus layer that has been shown to be very useful for burn patients and burn uh, recoveries. Also, the horseshoe crabs, which are one of our most ancient species on the planet, uh, their hemolymph can be used um, to detect uh, contaminants on medical devices and that kind of thing. I mean, really cool stuff. Uh, of course, we've got the pets and display aquaria animals, recreation, sport fishing, um, sea fishing, um, and then, of course, fish meals that are part of cosmetics and pet foods. Uh, ice cream, all that kind of stuff, and then, of course, fertilizer as well. But there are a lot of other products that you might not consider that some of our aquatic animals um, and plants are a part of those. Again, um, our aquaculture data always seems to be a couple of years behind. These numbers I'm sharing are from uh, NOAA's website from 2017, and you can see there I uh, particularly want to draw the comparison between these numbers where we've got the salmon, oysters, uh, mussels and clams and shrimp represented there, 32 million pounds of salmon. Now, again, if you're not familiar with the production numbers from more traditional livestock animals, we are really far behind. Um, for beef and poultry, those numbers are up in the billions of pounds here in this country. So again, the potential for the growth of aquaculture is, is significant, um, and we have got to be ready as the USDA um, to stand prepared to help our industry grow and make sure that the production practices and the health of the animals um, are being done appropriately. You can see from the bottom map there where the regional areas are for um, aquaculture. It does look like aquaculture exists in very coastal areas, but I, I really encourage you to not have that picture burned in your brain. Almost every state in this country has some form of aquaculture and an aquatic animal in production. This last decade, we have seen a freshwater shrimp a facility go into Minnesota. We've got cobia in production in Iowa. Um, so the potential for the expansion and all these different species and being in production, even in our inland states, is really huge. For example, you know, last year we responded to a tilapia disease outbreak in one of our um, landlocked states. And again, they were utilizing the, the geothermal springs that exist up there. Uh, to grow a warm water species out in a state that is really, well, for somebody that lives in Florida, is a very cold state. Um, so again, we see that kind of um, exciting production around our country even today. So aquaculture is growing. One, almost two million jobs, a 1.5 billion industry, and feeding 626 million pounds of seafood every year. Uh, to our American citizens. So some of you might be wondering, well, what the heck does aquaculture look like? Well, I'm just going to take a couple of slides, and this is not the complete picture at all, but it'll give you a feel about what aquaculture can and what aquaculture will likely look like uh, in the next 10, 20, 25 years. Um, and again, we need to be prepared uh, for growth in every aspect of aquaculture. This is, these images are projecting typical pond aquaculture. The top picture there is taken from the Mississippi Delta by one of our wildlife services uh, individuals, and you can see there two, three uh, catfish ponds, and if you're wondering if those black specks are dead fish, in fact not. Those are the double-crested cormorants that are raging war on our commercial populations of catfish and other produced animals uh, in that area. And you can see not only is that a biosecurity issue, but that is a predatory issue as well. Um, and we've been working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and our wildlife services colleagues uh, to address that and put the skills and tools in our producers' hands to mitigate that. 
down um, on the bottom there is actually the office that I work out of down in Ruskin, Florida. It is a demonstration facility for an ornamental fish farm. Again, ornamental ponds, those animals are typically a lot smaller uh, than our, our larger species, so the ponds are a lot smaller uh, in dimension. And again, there in the other picture is a typical catfish farm in the Mississippi Delta. And the top picture with the guy seining the fish pond, uh, that was a recreational farm out in uh, Currysville, uh, Missouri, uh, back a couple of years ago there. And so you can see uh, the different types of ponds that uh, exist to support aquaculture in this country. So ponds can be self-filling or, excuse me, I have to let the dog out real quick, sorry, he'll just continue to whine, then uh, they can be self-filling or we can fill them from uh, natural surface waters uh, as well. Also, we can see some ponds being are constructed with raceways in line so that they are flow-through type uh, uh, construction as well. Here I am showing a picture of a very sophisticated indoor, what we call recirculating aquaculture facility. These are what we think of when we think of our um, more progressive, intensive aquaculture situations where we are controlling 100% of the animal's environment. Obviously our aquatic animals are living in a, in a medium this water medium that it's not like walking into a poultry house where you can immediately detect that one of the environmental parameters might not be sufficient or optimal to sustain growth and life. Here we have to really become chemists at evaluating water quality, not only to make sure uh, that the system is functioning well, but also that those parameters are suitable for the species that we're culturing. We use different types of filtration, mechanical, biological filtration to make sure that these aquatic environments stay fit and suitable for the animals we're raising. This is just a very um, sophisticated example. The top picture on the left there, this building facility is up in Connecticut and grows European sea bass. Um, this is one of their quarantine rooms, and they have mirror images of about six or eight of these rooms. When they get the fingerlings in that are imported from the Mediterranean, they go into these individual rooms for a period of time for additional diagnostic testing, acclimation to the new uh, environment that these animals are in. Every room has its own dedicated system, own dedicated um, facilities and equipment. Uh, and then once that period is over and they've been released from these isolation rooms, they go out onto the floor, which are the other two pictures, and placed into these fiberglass tanks um, until they're ready for um, harvest. Many of these newer land-based systems are really interesting and almost novel for U.S. aquaculture. No live animals are leaving these facilities. These facilities are incorporating the processing plant there in-house with value-added options um, that are in, so completely integrated, of course, without the, the, the egg component to many of these. Um, but again, these products or animals are leaving, you know, on ice uh, filleted or prepared that way and going out to local markets uh, in the area. This has great potential to be in urban settings. Many of our companies that are in these um, areas are basically in warehouses um, that are around uh, urban settings. Uh, so again, when we talk about the story of our food and um, the local story, it becomes a really exciting option for a wholesome protein source. Then, as we look to the future of aquaculture, and when we talk about offshore aquaculture in federal waters, we are seeing, in, for the last two decades, really incredible technology to be able to grow fish safely out in these wild environments. Um, 
the more classic uh, sea cages there in the right-hand upper picture where you've got an inner tube um, around there that allows the sea cage to then drop down. Uh, these cages can be anchored or weighted so that they don't move in the water column uh, significantly, but they can be moved uh, if you need to. The other pictures are of these essentially huge bio balls where fish, after they've reached a certain size, usually from a land-based facility where um, we just left those um, indoor uh, land-based facility pictures, they're growing out there. They get stocked out into these huge bio balls, tons of robotic capabilities in terms of measuring um, fish density, feeding behavior, growth rates, swimming patterns. In fact, one company, Aqua Bite, uh, that presented something to us and to AVMA a couple of weeks ago, they can do facial recognition on individual animals swimming in these sea cages. So uh, the technology is incredible and super exciting there as well. Uh, these uh, big bio balls or domes or spheres, uh, again, can be anchored to the sea floor um, and be able to move around if there is a pending disaster, environmental or natural or otherwise, um, so that they can be around to make sure that the animals in those areas um, are receiving the best care. Now, this is really exciting as well, and where I think, you know, why we have been so excited the past year with the development of the VS five-year business plan and a new national plan, because really, as we look at expanding aquaculture into these marine environments in our federal waters, this is where the future is going, and some of these technologies and these boats um, are already being used in Norway and Chile in their waters. Uh, and these are just floating platforms of, of sea cages. Um, and so these move around. Um, animals get sucked out by essentially big vacuum cleaners um, and then taken to the ports of call so that they can uh, be taken to those local markets. Really incredible. So let's talk a little bit about the existing challenges to U.S. aquaculture and why we have been so adamant and really vocal lately within our aquaculture program that uh, this really is a future for the United States and a huge opportunity for USDA to be a part of this exciting agricultural entity. So. As compared to other countries, the U.S. ranks in the top seven of having the worst regulatory environment to support and um, allow aquaculture expansion in our country. Just the other night, we had a, a aquaculture panel with colleagues in Japan, and uh, they were sharing a lot of information about available and approved antibiotics here in this country. Um, I wish I had time to ask you all to guess, but in your mind, just guess how many approved antibiotics there are for our aquaculture producers. And this is only for the fish, right? So there are only four. In Japan, the laundry list um, of approved antibiotics, and when we cross-shared that data, the first comment out of our colleagues from Japan was like, Something must have gotten cut off because we only got four approved chemotherapeutics for use in production aquaculture. And of course, we were like, yeah, that's all our guys have access to right now. Um, and hopefully, as veterinarians and being familiar with animal production and population medicine, um, that tool cabinet is not where it needs to be. Um, Obviously, there is the, the social trend um, to move away from antibiotics, but we're just as limited on uh, the availability of vaccines um, as well. So we really do, and that's just one example, uh, the environmental permitting process, uh, the movement process and glow-out process really is very complex in this country. Many of our states um, have aquaculture and aquatic under animal health that fall under the Department of Natural Resources. And again, if you think back to those pictures of early Washington, D.C., 
That's because aquaculture really was born from fisheries um, where we were growing animals to stock out into wild um, settings. Um, but that has really changed now, and we need to um, support aquaculture as an agricultural commodity. Uh, so for the states that have that authority under the DNR, um, it can become a challenge for aquaculture to exist and be able to produce those animals just because of the, the mentality that there is a risk to the natural resources when, in fact, a large component of our industry is going to end uses that pose no risk uh, to our native natural resources as well. So we need to remember that. Also, if you think about that seed cage, it has less than 2% biomass existing in there. Um, and the, the, the CF, FCR, the carbon footprint and water use demonstrate that aquaculture is a very environmentally sustainable uh, production practice. We've already talked about the competition with imports. In fact, so bad that it's almost killed uh, the domestic catfish industry. And when we think back to the early versions of the Farm Bill and the cool country of origin of labeling, all that really started because of seafood and the competition and mislabeling of seafood products entering into this country and posing as direct competition to products that were grown here in the United States. Also already talked about the seed supply markets. Uh, in this country, we do not eat enough seafood. We prefer our beef and chicken um, and pork, and that's great. Uh, but we really do need to um, become better uh, seafood eaters, again, to support uh, the growth of our country. I already talked about the vaccines. All right. So a couple of years ago, uh, some colleagues that formerly in Arkansas, now at Virginia Tech, we helped one of the things we hear from our producers and our USDA stakeholders is the regulatory environment is too complex, it's too anti-aquaculture, and it's really stymieing our growth. But they really couldn't point to the economic impact of that. Um, so we helped um, Inglestone Aquatics develop surveys that really took each sector of our industry um, and broke it down to, to really investigate where those regulations, what regulations were impacting our producers the most. And you can see, and it's not unexpected, that the smaller farms are more impacted by the regulatory environment as it exists today. Um, but what you'll begin to see, though, is the different variations that these uh, regulations have. And we can see Lost sales is a big component of this, and lost sales is defined as uh, a missed opportunity to market animals that are that are available to be sold, but because of the regulatory environment, either from the environmental side or the animal movement and health testing side, they were not able uh, to successfully enter those markets um, or be competitive in those markets. You can see here for the bait and sport fish animals that fish health testing accounted for about 5% uh, of the regulatory costs. And we were all, huh, that's really interesting. Um, is that the cost of the diagnostics? Is that the cost of the veterinarian? And again, you have to remember for bait and sport fish, there are about maybe 10 states um, that represent the majority of this type of commodity. Uh, and some of those states have state-run programs that subsidize uh, the testing of these animals to participate in those state-run programs. So again, looking at that number was really interesting. And, and what consisted of that number? Then our colleagues ran a similar survey for the salmonid industry. And you can see, again, this fish health testing component, while seemingly very low in comparison to uh, the county regulations and other regulatory costs, but still 
around 10%, that can be pretty significant. And again, what was that cost? And it really turns out that it is the permitting process and how we are conducting these inspections for fish health, not necessarily the diagnostic testing, but how we are doing that, which to the aquaculture team on the VS side, when we started thinking about that, the solution to that is that we start looking at how to improve the processes that are being used to ascertain and assure animal health. How can we do that better? How can we do it smarter? So with our industry partners then, we started thinking, could we develop a domestic program? Now clearly the diversity and um, the diversity of the industry is impossible. There isn't an avian influenza disease. There isn't a brucellosis or a, a scrapie disease that is, uh, it, as we see in other livestock. It is too diverse. Um, even our OIE listed pathogens, we have um, nine to 10 for each of the different sectors uh, of the fish, crustaceans and mollusks. So that's 30 pathogens that are um, significant in terms of global enterprise uh, that way. So we sat down and we said, could we come up with some standards for ascertaining aquaculture health as a livestock production? Our industry was very clear. They did not want more regulations in addition to what they already had. They wanted it to be science and risk-based so that it could be scalable with new diseases, new technologies, new species um, coming on board, uh, but that also it had the power to address some of the concerns from our natural resource uh, entities and colleagues so that it did begin to strengthen uh, the animal health and security of all of our animals existing in this country uh, in the aquatic environments. So, Again, we wanted something that would allow the assurance of the health of the farm-raised animals. It could facilitate in the movement and trade of those animals and allow APHIS to leverage this program with our trading partners and say, listen, this is the standard that our aquaculture producers are meeting, uh, and we present this as a package that our animals are being produced in a in a and in an environment that uses considerate care, animal welfare, um, because we're looking at production milestones, uh, we're doing early disease detection, all those types of things. Um, it gives the industry an opportunity for branding and marketing, improving the story of aquaculture, uh, increasing that public trust that their food is being grown in a wholesome manner, with the utmost of care from our producers. Uh, and then also, there already exists a number of third-party verification programs for um, worker safety, uh, food uh, safety and inspection and security with the HACCP program that is led by our NOAA colleagues uh, and other third-party verifiers. Um, but none of those address animal health issues. And so there really was a vacuum here that thankfully we had an opportunity to step in and really begin to fill that void and become a leader in how we are going to establish aquatic animal health in our livestock production scenarios. So we came up with five principles. And I took the, these are the five principles and I'm going to go through each of these very quickly. Um, just really excited to share this um, with you. The concept of the aquatic animal health team, I really took from my experience when I was a dairy maid um, through undergrad and vet school, that it was never just the veterinarian that was providing nutritional advice, genetic advice, production management, impact on milk production, and milk wholesomeness, it really was that team mentality. And I think that that suits aquaculture very well as well. Uh, aquaculture, 
the veterinary community as a profession was not the first ones to be the key points of contact to give advice or guidance or diagnostics and treatment recommendations. It was our colleagues that uh, majored in biology, environmental sciences, marine biology. It did not exist under the veterinary profession. And in fact, many state veterinary practice acts specifically excluded our aquatic animals. So we have over 30 years of my career really had a hard time as a veterinary profession breaking in um, to how we can work with our aquaculture producers and be a value-added profession to what they are doing. And that task is still still a hill for us to climb. Um, and I, I love, you know, when I went out with some of these large animal veterinarians, they had that swagger where they could walk onto a beef farm or a dairy farm and look around and they could give advice on, hey, you know what, it might not be such a great idea to use that kind of nipple to feed those calves or, you know, dehorning or castration might be better done this way or, you know, have your nutrition guy look at the, the feed ingredients list. It looks like you might need a higher protein or whatever. So that's the kind of mentality that CAPS, we want to embrace with CAPS. Can be comprised of veterinarians, We've got a lay organization, the American Fishery Society, that certifies professionals to do aquatic animal health inspections and work. We cannot ignore them. We need to embrace them. Many of them are veterinarians. The majority aren't. And so, again, our industry are very comfortable at working with these non-veterinarian types. I think it's a mistake to cut off our nose and ignore the services that they provide. And again, when I was traveling through the South working with some of our catfish clients and hybrid striped bass clients, the relationship for the health and care of their population was not with the veterinarian. It was directly with their diagnostic laboratory. And that laboratory may or may not be led by a veterinarian. And so the veterinarian seemed to be left out of this whole picture of aquatic animal health they didn't establish a valid vet client patient relationship because they perhaps didn't feel comfortable, they didn't get trained in vet school, whole host of reasons for that. So this cap, really a keystone part of this is that they have an aquatic animal health team and the responsibility of that team is that they do develop this, whether you're a vet or not, a valid vet client patient relationship with the site. There's communication among the team members and they assist with training of the frontline workers with those animals so that they recognize the early signs of something not being right, um, recognize the clinical signs of disease um, and what those might mean, uh, and help them develop what we're calling our CAPS site-specific health plan. And I'll get into that in a little bit. And again, this big vet picture is that there is a relationship between the how well a producer is doing and how much they value the input and leadership of their their veterinarian. It's where I think our profession has fallen down is a lot of times our the vets were going out endorsing a health certificate, maybe looking at the population and being like, "Yep, everything's fine. Give me my check. I'll sign your certificate, and I'll be off the farm." That's really not what this should be about anymore. We need to take it to the next level and engage in these farmers on how we can bring veterinary medicine to be a real asset and value added uh, contributor to their, their farm in general as the big picture. Okay, so this is our site-specific health plan. You'll see across the top there the five components of CAPS and what we would expect to see delineated under each one of those sections. So aquatic animal health team was the first, first uh, program standard. The second is the risk evaluation, which consists of three steps, that for each species on the farm, for each type of production method they were using and for the pathogens of concern that were suitable for those 
uh, practices, what are those? What are those risks? And then further, what are the pathways that exist in an aquaculture setting for those pathogens to be introduced or spread around the farm? which finally would result in the development of appropriate risk mitigation practices such that we have a system for early disease detection um, through the training and development of thresholds that I'll talk about. Whenever the acceptable level of threshold is exceeded, we know that we've got something going on and we need to respond appropriately. And then for each one of those pathways, what are the on-farm practices that will appropriately mitigate or eliminate um, those risks. And that, of course, is your biosecurity plan. Now, in aquaculture settings, I like to keep things pretty simple, so keeping it to five so that I can remember, the main pathways that pose a risk to biosecurity in any aquaculture setting is the animals, coming onto the farm or moving around the farm, water, is your source water a protected water source or unprotected? How about the shipping water that's coming onto the farm if you're bringing animals onto your farm? The feed, again, a live feed, commercial feed, um, are you growing your own feed, um, that type of thing. Also the storage of those, the fomites, equipment, uh, people coming onto the farm, and then, of course, vectors. So animals, water, feed, vectors, and fomites um, are the five pathways that exist. So no matter what, when you're walking onto a fish farm, those are the things that we should be automatically thinking about, um, and how is this guy or this gal running this farm to mitigate those um, health risks that may exist on the farm. The third CAPS principle is surveillance. We are not protecting anything unless we're looking around the farm to determine what exists there already. And again, we have to have the, the purpose, why we are doing surveillance uh, in the first place. We should be doing surveillance to protect the health status of that, the, that population, but also to be on the lookout for any new things that might be uh, bypassing some of our mitigations and things and without looking we're not going to know what's going on. I don't know how it is in other uh, sectors, but our guys typically, and they love to tell us, nope, we're good. We don't have any disease issues. We've mitigated all of our risks and that kind of thing. And then sure enough, when you go dig down a little deeper into a questionnaire, you find out that they've got the sieve going on um, and that the health of their population really is at risk. And a lot of times it's just been luck. Um, that they haven't had a major outbreak. So we want to move away from being lucky, although that's really great. Those times are changing, and we need to know for sure what we're dealing with. Our surveillance strategies can be observational and risk-based surveillance uh, practices on the farm. Once, though, the fourth uh, component of CAPS is disease investigation. Now, to order a lot of our farmers when we were early on talking about CAPS was, um, again, well, we don't have disease. Um, I don't have to track mortality because it's so low. And sure enough, on one of those farms, I went out and I was like, well, where do you keep all your dead animals? And oh my God, it was this huge room with tons of those uh, Home Depot buckets filled with carcasses. And they were like, that's just a normal day, doc. Well, if you don't document that that's a normal day, my sphincters start to whistle and I get very worried. So we need to help these guys establish what their acceptable threshold levels are for morbidity and mortality. And when those acceptable levels get exceeded, that's when we need to launch a disease investigation, those types of things. Um, how those thresholds, uh, what they look like can be very different, different for the different life stages on the farm different for different end uses, those types of things. Um, and again, reporting. Again, I mentioned the OIE list, those lists, that OIE list exactly mirrors what we have in the NLRAD and what is part of our NARS now. In addition, states may have additional pathogens, for example, whirling disease caused by a, um, a parasite. Um, many states have their own separate uh, lists as well. 
Once we launch into a disease investigation, we need to make sure that the, the sampling is being done appropriately for the type of investigation we're doing. The type of di diagnostics that the samples are going to be tested with needs to be known and understood so that the pooling of tissues or the not pooling of tissues is suitable, again, to that purpose of why we're doing this type of investigation. Now, again, investigating a disease outbreak is much more simple than trying to ascertain and demonstrate the health assurance of a healthy population. So that's why these mortality and morbidity thresholds become very important. And just to give you an example here, a couple of years ago, we did a training out in Washington State at a uh, a facility out there, and as we were walking around, we were talking about caps, and uh, we discovered that their normal acceptable level of more mortality was 0.3% over five days, and so that was normal for them. If they went over five days or that percentage began to see an increase over those days, that's when the something ain't right gut clinch goes on, and you know you've got to start preparing to um, conduct an investigation. So in this particular case, the day we were there, they had almost 70,000 fish on the farm. They had 20 um, dead on arrivals. Um, that would be that 0.3%. But in the last day, they reported to us that they had 21 fresh dead animals and 102 mortalities. So that definitely exceeded what was acceptable to them. And so we started interviewing, well, what happened in the last week? Was anything unusual? Did pumps go down? Did oxygen go off? Those types of questions. And during that interview phase, we found out that, in fact, the population that had this event um, within the last five days on the farm, they had been spawned. So when you're spawning these female, in this case it's a rainbow trout, the guys um, squeeze their abdomens down and get those eggs out so that they can collect them into the collecting jars and then typically activate some milk from the males and boom, we've got some fertilized eggs there. But you can imagine that that can be a very traumatic process for these female animals um, not only are they getting sained out of the raceways, being collected, netted, then handled, then squeezed, um, it's no doubt that that is a very stressful, traumatic event on these animals. And so at that point, we determined that their mortality event for that one time was acceptable. There didn't seem to be a underlying disease issue. It was more... Um, that uh, we had a stressful event occur. So the final um, process and final uh, component of CAPS is response and recovery. Uh, what can we do to get this business back up and, up and going and meeting their market potential there? What do we need to do to reestablish the health status of that population? Um, do we need to depopulate? Do we need to vaccinate? Do we need to um, treat these animals with some kind of chemotherapeutic? And then, of course, and I, as I get older, the, the importance of reflection is becoming much more powerful. And I think, again, looking back, did something break down in our biosecurity practices? Did we do something unusual um, that might have uh, caused this to occur? Even looking at the spawning practices, is there something that we could be doing better to handle these animals so that the next time we can uh, reduce the numbers uh, that uh, had that uh, mortality episode? So I know I'm getting a little long in the tooth, but um, we have, thankfully, um, from support from our leadership, been able to pilot CAPS in a couple of different settings. Uh, to see how CAPS would really work. And they have all demonstrated different components of how challenging um, this is to have such a diverse industry um, participate in program standards like this. 
One of our pilots was with a cooperative entity in North Carolina that grow out an all-male uh, population of tilapia. These guys, these cooperative agreement would receive their tilapia fingerlings from a domestic supplier here in the United States that was a closed facility. They would ship those boxes by um, air to those um, to the airport near those farms. The farms would go pick them up. Um, and then distribute them among the different growers that are part of that cooperative. This uh, diagram just represents very quickly what that scheme looked like. Fortunately, these guys all came from the turkey and poultry production. They are still part of the Purdue poultry system that have these tilapia on farms. So these guys already knew about the importance of biosecurity. Um, and the process of doing things consistently. They would have these animals enter into quarantine areas. Um, lots were never commingled. It was an all-in, all-out type situation on a protected water source, a commercial pelleted feed. All of the cooperative entities fed the same thing. In fact, two of the, two of the different entities were exactly the same, same construction, same tank, same pump, same everything. Um, so that was it was a really interesting um, production scenario there. Again, just showing what those uh, tilapia buildings in North Carolina um, look like. Hopefully, it looks kind of like some of the poultry houses or other things, um, perhaps maybe more closed in uh, that way. But as we were taking these guys through the thought process of where their pathways of risk existed and where we might implement some meaningful protocols. Um, to establish animal health and eliminate the risk of pathogens getting into these systems, particularly their grow-out areas where they have the most investment in those populations. One, the source farm did not want to participate in CAPS, so automatically anything leaving that farm we considered a risk. Fortunately, again, you can see from here that they were going into a quarantine area. And if it wasn't a true quarantine, it was into isolation, but that we really did see a need to implement a more rigorous and robust health examination at the release of these animals. So they were just doing it based on uh, feeding behavior and that kind of thing, but we really thought at that point we need to protect that nursery and hatchery area because once they've left, again, the investment in these animals is exponential. Uh, and so we implemented a surveillance plan uh, where they were uh, able to scale uh, the number of animals that they would have to test over a certain amount of time uh, and be able to do it on a site-specific way. Again, some of these entities operated because of management and site constraints a little bit differently. So again, that site-specific component was really important uh, for this pilot. What we learned from the majority of our CAPS pilots was that it is really difficult to be in the field as a VMO or an inspector um, and have a hard checklist in front of you. Um, it's difficult to be engaged in talking to a producer and also trying to follow the checklist and that kind of thing. Um, I've done it my, myself a couple of times and ultimately I really felt like it created a barrier between being able to listen um, and engage and understand really what was happening. So uh, thankfully, Lori Gustafson and our team is working on a, on a way that we can a process that we can very thoughtfully um, move through the decision trees um, without having a checklist where we're just um, perhaps unthoughtfully checking those boxes. Subjective impressions are really important and we want to be able to capture those. What was an issue for one inspector was not for the other. Um, and so we need to make sure that we level um, the impact of subjective impressions so that we can do this in a harmonious and consistent way across all entities participating in it. Um, and then, of course, the usual challenge with something this diverse that implementing will be very hard and will take the cooperation of our state partners. So basically, as we leave the topic of CAPS, um, CAPS, the ABCs of CAPS, one, 
A, assurance that farm-raised aquatic animals are healthy, that the animals coming off of these production units are healthy. And we've been able to ascertain that because we are engaging them in surveillance activities that are meaningful, and we also have biosecurity practices that are meaningful in addressing the risks that are specific to that entity. It offers our stakeholders an opportunity for branding and marketing, um, which is obviously huge to them. And then it provides the confidence that APHIS is able to stand behind our participating producers and say, yep, we can assure that our guys that are participating in this program, because of our biannual inspections and our engagement with the aquatic animal health team, that we are sure that we don't have pathogens X, Y, and Z existing in these populations. So a little bit of the story. We have been working on CAPS since about 2014, and it has met a, stall, a stalemate, essentially, because we've just been really struggling on USDA with limited resources. Um, how should this aquaculture program be run since we really don't have a one pathogen or maybe even a handful of pathogens that we can sink our teeth into and develop uh, programs that target that. Instead, though, we really do have to look at this as a livestock management issue as a whole. Um, and so we had the opportunity in 20, end of 2019 um, and into 2020 to have the opportunity to be very reflective about the VS aquaculture um, units that are doing aquaculture and the opportunity that really lay in front of USDA to become the lead for aquatic animal health in this country. And what, as USDA, what value can we bring to these types of producers with their different needs and the diversity? Thankfully, and forever in debt to Dr. Larry Granger, who was tasked by VSET to be our sponsor for the aquaculture initiative, uh, both Alicia Marston and I were tasked to co-lead um, this aquaculture initiative. Um, again, ever since I've been with VS and I cut my teeth on the import-export side, um, and they're really in the world of aquatic animals, what we do on the program side really impacts the trade movement and marketability of our animals. And so thankfully, Alicia and I had worked together years before. Um, and so we had, I know that we have a very united vision about what aquaculture is and the potential and the opportunity for APHIS to be involved in that. And so um, we were able to lead all of our different uh, VS units that are engaged in aquaculture, S&P, FIOPS, DMB, and our program support services um, to really dive down and think about what does USDA, what can USDA do for aquaculture? What do they need? How can we do that? Um, so we have spent the better part of this year working on a five-year business plan goals. And I won't go through each of these. Um, you guys um, can read those. Um, our aquaculture business plan, uh, we're finally working on the final, final, final draft. Um, and we will obviously be posting that to our APHIS aquaculture webpage so that you can all see there. Um, each of the different programs will be responsible to implement um, the different goals and aspects that they have identified as activities that they would uh, commit to to see each of these goals over the five years become reality um, for USDA and our producers uh, that are are really leaning on us to get a lot of these things done. The five-year business plan, we finally have a budget that has been approved. Um, this $58 million over the five years, that's a total number. It does increase over the years, starting at year one, whatever year one may be. We are obviously hopeful that Congress and the President also see the, the value of making this kind of investment to catch up with what our aquaculture needs and really prepare for where aquaculture is going in this country for the future. Um, this is an APHIS level number. 
Um, but again, over that five-year period, if it starts in 2022, that's great. If it starts um, 2023, we will also live with that as well. Um, but again, we have a ramping up type situa situation where um, in terms of personnel, cooperative agreements, and just general resource needs for each of our different units to be able to um, create the work and then have the personnel to be able to meet those um, objectives. Uh, so again, uh, hopefully we'll see some of that funding start coming through and some of the um, congressional uh, budgets that get approved. We do have an appropriated line item for aquatic animal health, uh, and Dr. Marston and I are now working on developing an operational plan to describe the different activities uh, that we have listed there. So 2020 has been an incredible year in so many not great ways, I, I appreciate that um, with all of you, but it also has been such an exciting time for aquaculture in this country. Um, you may have heard uh, in 2008, USDA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and NOAA developed the National Aquatic Animal Health Plan, or the NAP. Over the past 12 years that that NAP has been in place, it has largely languished. Um, between the three competent authorities, the designated competent authorities for aquatic animal health, we each have very different perspectives. We have different stakeholder groups. And so developing an implementation plan for aquatic animal health was really challenging. And we just could never get it done over the past 12 years. So we have an opportunity with the signing of an executive order by President Trump that was signed in May on promoting American seafood competitiveness and economic growth. That bill, if you, or that executive order, if you haven't had an opportunity to read it, it is really super exciting. And what it finally has been able to do is bring commercial fisheries and aquaculture to the same table to um, really help each other and promote each other in a way that fosters the development of both. So that executive order, the front half of the order is about promoting sea, uh, commercial fisheries, um, permitting those areas appropriately. And then the second half, what's emphasized is the expansion and development of aquaculture in this country with a particular emphasis on development in federal waters, our offshore areas or in the EEZ. Um, and so now we are already, and we're not six months from the signing of that executive order, we are already seeing the approval of pilot projects um, out in the EEZ, both in California and here in Florida in the Gulf of Mexico. It is moving very fast already. Um, at the bottom half of that executive order, we do have a section in there about aquatic animal health. And the task to our USDA secretary was, do we need a new national plan? If so, what is that going to look like and how are we going to run it? There is also an aqua bill that is, again, back in front of um, Congress uh, this executive period. And that further emphasized that USDA has the lead as the competent authority for aquatic animal health and how we will begin to promote and protect our veterinarians that are going to have to be practicing out in these federal waters. There is no precedent, not on Bureau of Land Management land, not in any other realm, do we have a similar situation where we would have a private practitioner um, working in federal lands that are not surrounded by a state entity. So the AVMA and USDA really had to come up with essentially a policy on how is that going to be able to be done. Uh, the AVMA stood up a policy that a veterinarian could practice in federal waters if they had a valid vet state license. They were accredited by USDA, and they had an established valid vet-client-patient relationship um, with the facility they were working. Really exciting, totally unprecedented, and I think it sets a really nice tone to support 
our um, professional colleagues out there at being able to get this done to help us protect and support our aquaculture producers that are moving out into this area. So our secretary determined that it was time to really look at the national plan. Clearly it wasn't working. It did not have the support from our stakeholders and really was unimplemented by our other federal partners. So we stood up a working group within the last six months um, of stakeholders and have worked hard to drill down to what should be in a national plan? What, what are the infrastructure factors that need to be in place to allow our industry to flourish, exist, but also have a meaningful infrastructure to conduct diagnostics, to do sampling, to have the state and federal oversight so that we can respond to disease outbreaks, um, that we can ascertain and assure animal health for our trading partners. These are the first, what is there, seven or eight listed there, reporting. We stink at reporting of aquatic animal pathogens in this country. Year after year after year, we have struggled with this communication piece of do natural resource people need to report? Does it need to be reported in wild animals? Yes, yes, yes. Um, our science and academic community need to be a part of this as well. So, I'm so hopeful for the NLRAD um, so that we can begin to close that loop um, and really get some, some strength behind the activity of reporting these diseases. Laboratory accreditation, we have a number of systems where USDA will approve labs to test for certain pathogens for export. Uh, we have labs that are private, academically funded, um, state funded, federally funded labs, and we all seem to be doing different things. None of our assays in the aquatic animal world, even the OIE listed ones, are validated. The cost structure is just not there to support that kind of work for aquaculture yet. So again, when we talk about the gold standards of our diagnostics, we are really in kind of a gray zone where we um, we need better better guidance and infrastructure around what labs are doing this testing and the assays they're using to do it. Uh, we have within this national plan proposed that any labs conducting work to establish the animal health for the movement or export of those animals should be participating in a lab quality management system, either through AAVLD, ISO, or any other system that might exist that APHIS would accept. Testing standardization, develop a library of fit-for-purpose diagnostic assays that can be used and shared with all of our laboratories that are conducting this type of testing so that we are able to develop a database where we can compare apples and apples so that we can begin to share with our industry, okay, this region is endemic for this and this region is free so that we can, again, scale the amount of surveillance and testing and strengthen or relax some of the biosecurity practices that need to be in place for farms operating in these different areas. We need to have national surveillance, and we've got the CIS aquaculture plan by our SIA colleagues um, that, that um, uses these um, science and risk-based strategies to conduct surveillance. We need surveillance to be able to leverage um, again, with our trading partners, how we are conducting surveillance, uh, what pathogens exist, um, and, you know, again, demonstrate why we are doing things at the national level. Surveillance, again, would support the need for import controls. Again, this is at the national level, not at the farm level, but the implementation of meaningful import controls. If you can believe it, right now in this country, USDA, only has import health controls for tilapia, some tilapia species, and some cyprinid species, the koi and goldfish animals for SVC, and TILV for the tilapia. That's it. Everything else that's aquatic is entering into this country with no federal requirements, with the exception of Title 50 for salmonids, 
under U.S. Fish and Wildlife, but that legislation was implemented so long ago that the pathogens that really um, present serious health and trade risks are excluded from that import control. ISA, uh, infectious salmon anemia virus, and salmon alpha virus are not even part of Title 50 because of those are the newer uh, pathogens that we see. So again, if the states aren't implementing an import control, we are putting our industries at risk um, because we really lack that kind of control at the national level. We need a system for national data management and, of course, strengthen our education and training of professionals doing aquatic animal health work uh, in this country. A final component of the proposed plan puts forth four options for health inspections in the United States that USDA can stand behind and say, okay, if our producers are participating in these voluntary programs to meet a business need or a branding marketing need, we will stand behind the folks that implement one of these four practices on their farm. The first, and we've already talked about it, is CAPS, the Comprehensive Aquaculture Health Program Standards. The benefit for producers to participate in a program like CAPS that is an all-encompassing livestock management plan is that over time they would be able to um, participate in risk and pathogen-based reductions in sampling, saving them money inevitably over time and is still ascertain the same level of health confidence on their farm. And that's really important. And I hope by having the acceptance and recognition of participation in CAPS that our producers will finally meet a day where they can move animals domestically uh, with more uniform and consistent standards. And also we will have foreign trading partners that look at CAPS and say, yes, this is a system that we recognize as a value-added livestock health program. We, in fact, had a thumbs up, or I think it really was more in the form of uh, from our Japanese colleagues the other night. Um, they loved the concept of CAPS, um, so that was super exciting. Uh, and I think we have a number of colleagues up in Canada that also are super excited and supportive of us really moving uh, to promote CAPS. If we have an entity, though, that for whatever reason can't implement biosecurity to the full strength of CAPS, we have two options now for them, a premise freedom designation for specific pathogens in aquaculture settings. It's a much more um, uh, tight program. Not a lot of people, I think, could probably afford to do it because it does not allow for risk-based or pathogen-based reductions over time. They would have to stay at a very high level of testing because their biosecurity and other surveillance practices are perhaps not up to what we would like to see with a CAPS entity. So again, to, to ascertain the same power of what we're able to stand behind, that has a much more rigorous uh, component to it. Then we have for folks that need to do lot by lot testing um, where they can't do the whole farm uh, designation, we have a cohort test negative status that is a temporary assignment to a defined lot of animals, and that health status is assigned for only about 45 days. We're still fussing with the number there. Um, but again, that would allow us to assure the animal health of that unit given specific biosecurity standards around that unit, but again, ascertain the health of that population and get them out the door, move to where they need to go, um, and then their obligation is over to maintain that health status. Then, again, very important component to the offshore marine entities that we have to develop a program where we are able to ascertain the health of those animals that are being grown hundreds of miles offshore, sometimes at 100 feet um, down, we're not obviously going to have veterinarians that are able to dive those sites on a regular basis or every time they need to move animals. So what is our infrastructure process um, to be able to 
assure the animal health moving from those entities, and that is offered uh, there in our option four. So the next steps for the National Aquaculture Health Protection and Inspection Plan, it is currently already being reviewed um, by our federal partners, EPA, FDA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and NOAA. That broader suite of federal partners, I think, is going to really benefit us in the long run of having a plan that is meaningful to all entities um, at the federal level. And that is right now being run through the, a subcommittee on aquaculture through the National Science and Technology Council um, that has been stood up through the White House. Uh, after that review, their comments are due back next Tuesday. Um, after we've gone through those and vetted them with our working group, we will then share them in a more broad way with some of our associations, AFS, um, the American Fisheries Society, AFWA, uh, the Great Lakes Fish Health Commission, AVMA. We want everybody to be able to review this plan have their input, but at the end of the day, USDA will be leading this plan as the competent authority to protect and lead aquatic animal health uh, in this manner. We have asked our federal partners to include language within the proposed national plan of their roles and responsibilities and how we can all begin to bring unity to a lot of this thing. One big component of this is that participants in the CAPS or PREM Freedom, uh, should we should be able to justify to state EPA agencies um, that the effluent, water effluent leaving the farms, if we cannot find the pathogen on these farms, there really is zero risk that those pathogens would be leaving in the effluent. And that's the integrity of this process that we really want to bring uh, so that we are protecting our natural resources at the same time promoting livestock production um, in an aquaculture setting. So as a recap, aquaculture is food security, not only for the world, but for this country as well. And I really hope that we stay um, on this really exciting path that 2020 has presented us with, that USDA enters this opportunity and potential for really growth of an agricultural sector that is unseen in this country. It's gonna be super exciting um, and we need to be ready to feed our people in this country should exports from other countries really begin to see a downturn because they are self-investing in their own populations. We need to be ready for that time now. Aquaculture is incredibly diverse. Um, I really struggle um, and I appreciate the diversity in other sectors, um, but this one is really unique, not only in the number of species, the, the number of production settings and options and scenarios that we have available to us, the number of environments that we can grow these animals in between freshwater and saltwater and everything in between, um, it is uh, an incredible field. And we have heard it for years now, our domestic industry needs USDA to lead them to be able to, again, assure animal health, be able to brand U.S. farm-raised aquatic animals from this country as a high-quality, value-added animals and products that can move worldwide with safety, security, and confidence um, because we're standing there helping them uh, protect and promote both their animals and natural resources. All right, you guys. Um, I'm finished. I hope you guys found this interesting and exciting. I am happy to take questions now. Liz, thank you. We do have a couple questions. Um, one of them was, was the 62% of food from fish by 2030, was that globally or in the United States? Globally. Okay. And how is discharge from facility monitored to prevent introduction of anything to endemic biome? 
Hmm. I'm not sure I, I completely understand the question, but so if, if effluent is typically uh, water coming off of a fish farm is what we think of it, or water that is passed through either a coastal area that's growing some of our crustaceans, um, typically it is the state EPA that will regulate um, uh the volume and quality of that water coming off of these essentially farming locations what we see and hopefully you guys already know this that water that's coming off of a coastal area or going through a shellfish farm is way cleaner that's what these animals do is filter out that water so the water leaving those farms is actually better than what is coming into those locations but if we're talking about, you know, if we're worried about the sea cages or the intensive farming, recirculating aquaculture facilities, nobody or very few state entities are monitoring for pathogens that are coming through that effluent. They are basically really worried about the human health pathogens and the, the, the denigration of water quality because it's going through a farming entity. Um, but what, you know, again, we can do through these different programs is assure, again, that the pathogens that are of concern for that species being cultured um, is free of those things that might be, might be coming out in that water. And that's why, again, reaching out in this new national plan and engaging EPA at the federal level, hopefully um, we can complement what they're doing in terms of the water quality for any of the coli's and uh, chemicals that would be coming off these sites um, and assure that, again, for our producers that participate in these, that that is a reduced risk from those sites. Anyway, if I didn't answer that question um, or I've confused you more, shoot me an email. I'm always happy to chat or talk. The next question is, how well do these various ocean containment systems survive storm systems? So that's a great question, and we've had in the media and, I mean, in reality, it happens that some of these sea cages can get damaged. They can get damaged by getting loaded and weighted down with biofouling on those nets, um, and we this was one of the factors they think that excuse me, led to the escapement off the coast of Washington State where the biofouling was so heavy on those cages that it eventually led to the collapse of the structure itself and released 300,000 um, salmon up there. So it happens. There, these nets are designed, um, obviously, that are appropriate so that the animals can't go through the netting and also that wild animals or predators, marine mammals, seals, sea turtles also can't get in. And so they have determinants around these uh, cages so that they don't get into those problems. Also, our colleagues at the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, the Coast Guard, are working with NOAA, and this is NOAA's primary role, if you look at the executive order, with EPA is to really dive down into the modeling and siting of the aquaculture areas around this country. Not every area is going to be appropriate for aquaculture. And in fact, it's going to be probably very limited because of these different factors. We don't want these sea cages to be in a path of marine mammal routes. We don't want them to be in the path of vessels or anything else. Um, so, Biofouling can contribute to that. Um, you know, these these nets can fail. They are being designed better and better all the time to avoid that. Remember that these guys, they have an investment in these animals. They don't want to release them. Um, that is not how they make their money. So they are being really well designed to avoid um, collapse, holes, destruction. And again, they are portable. So if they see a hurricane or an oil leak or anything like that that might be pending, they can move these. Again, it has to be into a permitted site, but
but they can avoid those uh, areas that a natural disaster and environmental disaster is occurring. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Um, are you concerned about mercury levels in fish? And with the persistent rising levels, do you foresee fish not being wholesome in the future? So I'm a mother, um, and mercury certainly is a um, concern if you have a condition that might predispose you to the accumulation of mercury, that kind of thing. So, yes. Um, but what SDA has been able to demonstrate and our partners at Monterey Bay Aquarium with their seafood watch list um, is that unless you are consuming a great deal of very oily um, uh, and particularly wild-caught animals, uh, the risk of having a mercury toxicosis from the consumption of um, marine fish species is pretty low. Um, again, pregnant women and anybody that has a propensity that way should avoid it. Now, as a myth buster, um, and my parents are the worst, it drives me crazy because my dad's like, I'm never eating farm-raised fish. The Atlantic, the, the wild-caught salmon has a better color. It's got better omegas. That is not the case. No science has been able to defend that myth. Uh, the animals that are farm-raised have an equivalent nutritional value than our wild-caught animals. And if you think about it, uh, the wild animals, you can't control what areas they are swimming through or into or have been exposed to. And some of our more oily species can be really great bioaccumulators of things that we know are out in our environment and degrading in our uh, marine uh, areas as well. The, the farm-raised animals like the Atlantic salmon, they are in those net pens in a sited area that has been reviewed by EPA um, for food safety by NOAA. Those are in areas that we know have a very low risk for that, and those animals are not out in those cages for the same length of time that perhaps some of our wild-caught species might be. Also, if you're concerned about the color of your Atlantic salmon, it is the the xanthanthins or whatever they are that get put into the feed are the same natural ingredient that these animals would be eating out in the wild anyway. So, um, again, it's kind of a myth buster there. And if you're interested in more myth busters, the NAA has a great webinar um, with some colleagues who go through debunking each of these myths. So if you live with somebody that doesn't want to eat farm-raised seafood, maybe ping them to those. <laughs> I think you might have answered this. What is being done to reduce mercury in the fish we eat? Yeah, nothing, I mean, again, nothing specifically. The commercial pelleted feeds um, are, you know, secure. They, um, they, you know, if we're not intentionally feeding our animals any of this mercury, any of thing that's grown on a farm obviously has a very low risk. And, again, the ones who are raising out in these open marine environments aren't there that long, um, and again, they're specifically sited and permitted in areas that have that suitable quality water. And then, wouldn't using sea nets, cages, and vessels in open waters expose the fish to various pollutants that endanger consumers? Yes, that's true, too. And so we would have, and I'm sure the other federal agencies that um, conduct food safety, food security, and wholesomeness and that kind of thing are, again, they're making sure that we're citing these areas in, in locations that we know um, do not have some of those risks. There's also always that interface between wild animals and the animals that are existing out there and the transfer of pathogens or bacteria, um, as well as any of the environmental contaminants. But again, that, that exists uh, whether you're eating farm-raised or wild-caught. Obviously, from the farm-raised side, there is much more infrastructure, regulation, and control around that. And then the last question we have right now is, why can't I ever find in grocery stores salmon that's labeled as farmed? All the bags I see say wild caught. 
So hopefully that's going to be changing. And if you haven't heard, we now have an indoor Atlantic salmon facility down outside Miami, a cold water species being cultured in one of the hottest states in the country in the most crazy area of our state. Um, and so we, I think, are just, and they just did their first commercial harvest. What the plan is for the, and that's just one of many now. We've got one uh, located out in California. Of course, we've got what was already existing up in the New England area. We have seen over the last less than five years an incredible investment in domestic aquaculture in these land-based facilities. Uh, and as these facilities, um, Aqua Bounty, Atlantic Sapphire, Cook Aquaculture, um, they are all going to be have an opportunity to flood our domestic market with farm raised Atlantic salmon that was grown in this country. And really be watching your store shelves now um, because we are going to be seeing that influx of products of being farm raised. Before, um, we really only had one company up in the New England area that was supplying Atlantic salmon. They do a great amount of export, uh, so we weren't having our local domestic market see a lot of the animals that they were raising. But now that we have multiple companies doing this, I suspect that we're going to start seeing it. Costco, Sam's Club, grocery stores, all of it's coming. Also, if um, – You've heard of uh, Love the Wild. Check their website out. Um, they specifically work with not just U.S. producers, but producers around the world. And again, their message is, if we support aquaculture, we are loving the wild because we are protecting the natural stocks of those animals there. But you can follow their story um, as well. Um, great company. And they will ship you seafood that's grown farm-raised um, here in the United States little plug there. Um, so there's another question. Is there any data comparing activity levels of wild versus farmed fish? And if this affects muscle quality and taste? I'm sorry, Liz, can you repeat the question? Sure. Is there any data comparing activity levels of wild versus farmed fish? And if this affects muscle quality and taste? I gotcha. Sorry. I was thinking muscle, the bivalve, not the muscle. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. I can certainly um, look into that. You know, um, the f fish, oftentimes, they don't really ever rest um, because they have to keep water flowing over their gills for respiration and excretion. Um, little cocktail factoid, fish excrete, excrete 90% of their ammonia across their gills. So they're constantly swimming, whether they're farm-raised or wild. Um, I haven't seen a uh, – I'm sure it exists – the muscle uh, texture or quality or shelf life. Uh, I do know that in a number of species, they have looked at uh, the proportion of um, white and dark muscle tissue – uh, and also the shelf life of the wild fish versus the farm-raised fish. And I can't remember exactly what the synopsis was, um, but I'm happy to dig that out and uh, pass it along if that person asking that question will remind me. Okay. Um, the next question is, do you eat raw oysters and sushi, or do you know it's too risky? Would you advise no. your friends not to eat raw? <laughs> No, I no, I um I do eat raw seafood. Um, the important thing to remember, and this is what I tell all my friends and family, and whoever I get a chance to open up my mouth about aquaculture to, if there were, and there are, I will not feed my family a couple of things. One is imported shrimp. No way, Jose. Unfortunately, and. For most, probably, you guys out there, um, that's all you're going to see in the grocery store unless you live near a fresh market. And, again, I'm not slandering or saying anything, but, again, if you're asking me personally what do I not feed my family, do not feed them imported shrimp, and I do not feed them imported tilapia. Um, 
part of that is because I always try and buy U.S. farm-raised whatever the product is, um, but also because uh, those are the two species that most oftentimes are found to have residues or contaminants. Uh, again, with that 90% seafood that we're importing, FDA is only able to check less than 2% of that 90% that's coming in. Of that 2%, 82% of those imports that they do inspect fail the inspection because of a contaminant or residue or documentation issue. So um, knowing a little bit about the culture of um, tilapia in other countries, yuck, no thank you, and then also shrimp are um, and it's interesting story about shrimp, and I realize we have seven minutes. Sorry, you guys. Please feel free to drop off. Um, we have the world's domestic brood, or the the world brood stock of many of our human consumption uh, shrimp species in this country. Uh, many of the big corporations that do shrimp production have their brood stock here in Florida. Hawaii, Texas, uh, and those brood stock and those companies then have them spawn here in the United States, and then once they reach usually about less than 20 days old, what we call post-larval stages, they export those to other countries, primarily Asia, uh, and the animals are grown out there, and then slaughtered for human consumption and then frozen, and we buy them back here. Um, and so those practices, um, no thanks. I'd rather eat a wild-caught shrimp any day over that. Um, and also, please also remember that I know we always say, oh, never frozen, always fresh. That is not true. Uh, there is no way we're getting fresh seafood from Chile or Norway that hasn't been frozen. Um, all of our um, sushi grade, everything has been frozen at some point. Uh, but I still eat everything, but I would never feed my family again the, the imported tilapia or shrimp. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? As of right now, I don't have anything in the chat. Well, thanks, you guys, so much. I realize two hours is a long time over lunch for many of us to hang in there, and I hope you're taking something away, and I hope to work with all of you um, as we bring and roll out aquaculture to all of our different units and uh, folks. Thanks. All right, and I'd like to thank you, um, Kathleen, also for this great presentation and for everybody that joined today. Um, if you have any other questions, um, of course, you know where to get a hold of Kathleen. Um, and um, with that, I will bid you all a great afternoon. Awesome. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, event producer. Thank you. Bye, you guys. That concludes Bye. our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.